I'll start uh, the session first uh, from from Venkat, your perspective. Uh, I think uh, before we go, just one quick perspective on on the digital payments right now in the country. Uh, one, I think we are a developed country in terms of payments, digital payments. Uh, Everybody is replicating our uh, model of not just UPI but all other products as well. It's not just UPI. Everybody thinks about UPI the only thing. But if you go to villages, you have APS, then you have APB also making an impact. So it's, it's a fabulous story getting built. Uh, but of course, uh, there are areas where uh, enough work has not happened. Uh, if you look at uh, B2B payments, there are holes, uh, not holes, actually, uh, nothing exists right now. If you look at the B2B payments, we are still riding on RTGS NAFT, which the country uh, got created, uh, in-country got created in 2002, 2003, and we're just replicating that across and creating virtual accounts on top, which actually none should exist. We should have a proper account why virtual account, right? So there's a lot of piece of work which is remaining on the corporate side. And of course, the way uh, we have to look at it is that on the rural side, the products are not enough. Uh, there's a lot of constraints out there which are not uh, helpful. So we, when we work in villages, uh, the, the, the dependency on, on, on the APS is very high. And then it reduces in the cash point. Somebody has to go somewhere and, and engage. It's complicated, right? So I think a lot of work has happened, which is brilliant. We are, we are leaders in the world on digital payments. But if you look at the aggregated need of the country, I think I would we would have slashed maybe two or three percent out of it on a overall basis. So I, I think uh, my question to you, Venkat, is uh, for rural India, how is this digital payment coming up, uh, and what are the things which you are focusing on? What are the gaps? Overall perspective. Uh, the overall development has been very. You have to remember, uh, they, 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 IPPV is basically the postal bank, right? So it is humongous, right? Just by size, it's just not. Uh, they just don't talk about it, but the amount of work they are doing is fab. So, and they're also turning into profitable entity as well. So, so yeah, makes sense. Yeah, uh, I think the overall growth uh, and development, especially with regard to the digital payments, had been uh, you know very very fascinating, so to say. Uh, if you look at uh, the overall approach of the country towards financial inclusion, uh, that itself has been uh, very very path breaking, because of the fact that first and foremost thing we addressed uh, the access part which is uh, opening more and more bank branches, and that's where uh, the uh, ability of uh, Department of Postal uh, Network uh, to be utilized as uh, access points has, has come into play. And that has, uh, in one shot, it has increased uh, the network access uh, by 2.5 times, uh, because there are around 1,60,000 post offices. That is one, and the Jindan movement has uh, given a uh, larger fillip in terms of opening more and more uh, bank accounts. So having bank accounts and access is you know, one uh, side of uh, problem solving. The next problem solving is that how do you make these accounts more and more transacting? So that question is answered through routing of uh, the entire DBT benefits through bank account. So this way, uh, I think we've solved the first, or across the first hurdle of the financial uh, inclusion. Uh, and added to that, uh, with the growth of uh, products like AEPS, BBPS, and uh, UPI has only added uh, more and more. Like you mentioned about AEPS. So initially, you know, when the bank started, we've seen more and more AEPS transactions happening. But as things uh, started uh, evolving, we've seen more UPI transactions. And you know, today, we do 80% of transactions in digital. It used to be 80% in cash in the beginning, and now uh, it's 80% digital. So which means more and more people are used to these uh, digital payments, and they find a whole lot of convenience uh, when it comes to a uh, product like uh, UPI. Fantastic, fantastic. UPI and I, and I have not come, it's not possible, right? I'll just add on to you have built something fab, so it's good. No, I'll, I'll just focus oh, you, you need to be closer to the mic. Uh, I, I, I think I'll elaborate a bit on B2B, right? The way I look, we look at it, right? I think you mentioned uh, virtual accounts, right? And uh, see, the good thing about B2B is I think 99% of it yet flows through banks, right? I mean, whether it's NEFT, RTGS, and all. So the guardrails in terms of the money in and out is very much there. I think what's missing is the interoperable interface in between. And I think that's what UPI has solved, right? So I think what we need to do is, uh, I mean, as an ecosystem, we need to really peel it very horizontally and then look at what we need to solve, right? Uh, so, if, and obviously, B2B clearly is a more harder problem to solve, right? There are larger parties, there are larger flows, and so on and so forth, right? So what, what, what we're really looking at now, and we've done a bit of it at Razorpay, but 
across the industry, there is no standard as such, right? And that's where right. the businesses and the breaks and you can say the friction and then you do virtual account and so many things, right? So now just extrapolate that, right? And if you really go deeper into what is a B2B flow, unlike a P2M flow or a P2B flow where the endpoints are very much defined, in a typical business transaction, like a trade transaction or any of those, there are so many multiple endpoints and there is so much more data that needs to be exchanged, right? Look, for example, if it's a logistic order or a shipping order, right? It is touching so many hands. When do you release the order? So the flow of money, I think alone will not solve the problem. I think right. the flow of the information, the data richness, right? And I think if you look at uh, DLT, right, uh, which is very synonymous with uh, blockchain, but if you peel that, I think DLT to a certain effect can solve some of this is because you can really move the artifacts in a very tokenized form, right, in a very secure form, right? For example, if there is an LGLC underlying that is there, how do you know whether the event has happened? And that's right. where smart contracts come into play. Now the challenge is most of the, you know, including UPI, right? Uh, and UPI is fantastic as a protocol. It's pretty centralized. There is a network running it. I think what would happen is when you take something like this in a B2B world, you need to have something which is more decentralized, right? So, and I think that's really what is going to help. So, uh, do I see someone really solving the issue right now? No, I think we are trying to do it in our pockets and our islands. But coming together of the industry and agreeing on some kind of standardization over there is really going to help, right? I mean, just as a reference, uh, there is an organization called Patriot, if I'm not mistaken, Patriot, okay. right? Uh, they've based it on DLT, they're doing some of this stuff. And if I have to add, right, this India-Singapore tie-up, right, on the pay now UPI, I think while it starts with P2P, P2M, but imagine if Singapore and India open up their books to each I other. I agree. And I think that's where the real power will come in. So long way to go, but I think NPCI uh, is really setting the standard over there, right? Uh, while P2P, P2M can happen, I think there's a billion dollars that comes in into India and a few million that goes out of India, so on and so forth. But if you get into the trade side of life, I think that's where uh, it will really, uh, really, really start scaling, right? Maybe quick uh, view from your side on, on B2B uh, from a cross border perspective. How do we build, right? Because uh, what the gap is known, right? Everybody knows the gap. Uh, but how do we fill for that gap? How should we, the country approach or network should approach? Who should approach and who will solve? I think uh, the central entities, right, whether you call it uh, METI, governments, right, and G20, I think, is a brilliant forum for that, right? And I think India's influence, uh, especially in this government, has really uh, reached a very different level, right? So imagine even if we can get these corridors going with two, three countries, I think we'll be in a good place, right? Uh, I, I think the key, the worry for me always is uh, if you keep converting everything back to dollars, it's going to be a challenge, right? And there's going to be a pause in the money flow. Uh, pause the money flow, put it very simply, the way I understand that if the money is locked in a conversion or lying somewhere idle, it attracts some kind of risk and risk has a cost to it. It's lying idle, right? So again, this opening of the books, I think is a great way to do it. I mean, in a way, you're trying to say that we will not go the swift way, whether it's swift or swift GPI, I heard about bit about it, right? But it doesn't solve for it. So I think even if, uh, and you know what happened in this Ukraine, Russia war, right? So if India can create a block with two, three friendly countries, you know, maybe a couple of Middle Eastern countries, uh, maybe someone like Singapore and a couple of others, I think the government knows best where we in have the right kind of influence and create this block and do something which could be based on something like a DLT and then give it to a central entity. Uh, I'm just taking this freedom to say someone like an NPCI to design the architecture, right, and the protocols. I think we'll have a winning combination. But I clearly see that's two, three years away from you. I, I agree, it is a bit far. So, uh, I think uh, moving ahead to uh, Sachit, you, uh, you run one of the uh, pretty large uh, uh, sort of cash management uh, platform in the country. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of work which is, needs to be done and you're already doing a lot of it. So, do, does the country need a separate network or a se separate collection framework? What does the missing leg, leg right? I know. If it comes out really well, cash management is not required. So I also know the flip side of it. If everything is fine, then you don't need. But I have hope at scale things will change, right? So any perspective on what do we need most, uh, Sachit? Yeah, so I think, uh, and uh, you know, given that we do run a large cash management product and we do interact with a number of CFOs across, the, uh, across sectors, and uh, given my vintage, I do remember a CFO telling me even 20 years back, that his biggest problem was that he doesn't get the relevant information. I agree. And just two years back, uh, Swift and I think uh, 
BCG or one of the consulting firms did a survey with CFO, some of the largest uh, companies, and the topmost requirement was still we don't get the relevant information, which is what you were referring to, saying that banks have built virtual accounts, etc. So I think that gap is still there. It hasn't been solved. The rails are there, whether it's NEFT, RTGS, which came way back in 2004. Now we have UPI, BBPS. I think all the tools are there. It is a matter of forward and backward integration. Uh, will the banks be able to solve it on their own? Probably not. Otherwise, they would have done it, right? Uh, we as a country have still not gone on to Pobo, Kobo, you know, payments on behalf of, collections on behalf of. So it's being done in various shapes and forms, not regulated, and there are various issues around it, but we still haven't taken that giant leap. So that's one issue. So I think it is going to be a bit of forward and backward integration, and that's where the ecosystem will need to expand. Today, fintechs like Razorpay, they are working a lot in terms of making sure that the relevant information is available and they carry it along with the payment, or not really along with the payment, on top of the payment, right? Capture it at various stages and provide it to the corporates, both on the pay side and the receive side. But uh, I think somewhere the ecosystem will have to expand into the accounting players, into the ERP players, whether it's ERP players like SAP, Oracle, or the larger side, or, you know, for the MSMEs, uh, you know, whether it's Tally, Zoho, and, you know, so many of those. So I think that ecosystem needs to expand. Probably that is the forward and backward integration, which is really going to uh, make this seamless and as seamless and as easy as it is for the, you know, individuals doing it on the P2P side and, you know, probably make it as seamless and simple on the B2B side. So for, for a corporate, MSME or the largest corporate in the country, information is the key. The timing of the information is key. And to my mind, the ecosystem needs to now expand to be able to address that problem. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Sabir, from your perspective, uh, I think Bharat Pay obviously uh, changed the entire uh, game on how merchants uh, came on board uh, the platform. Uh, your structure has really worked, I think. Uh, the amount of number of people who have come on board on the merchant side is amazingly high. Uh, you also have uh, a situation where you are working with closely with bank. You have you are partnering uh, and you are a stakeholder in a bank as well. So, how the fintech and and, and uh, from a payment and beyond a partnership can happen closely between a fintech and a bank, and how what are the opportunities for both? And which is very practical because you are doing it on the ground. Yeah. Uh, so. See, uh, I think fintechs and bank, uh, even earlier or even now, uh, I think they work a lot more closely than what is sort of made out, I right? Agree. It seems often that if you read stuff that they are on the opposite sides uh, with a lot of uh, strain. But I think that's not the case, right? Uh, even when, you know, even if you take just the, the UPI payment stack product, right? Uh, while we did a lot of merchant acquisition, we did the merchant servicing, uh, the overall merchant experience, the merchant app, right? The, the UPA stack has been powered by the banks. Uh, to make it scalable, to reach a certain size, both in terms of base, as well as in terms of the kind of number of transactions TPV you do, the stack at the bank side also had to evolve and sort of keep pace with the scale. So I think the collaboration has always been there. But now as we, uh, you know, as we reach a certain scale in payments, there are a lot more areas beyond payments uh, where we see we can collaborate with the banks. Right? So first is the whole, uh, you know, what we call as neo-banking in some ways. Uh, today, you know, a uh, merchant has a sort of a, uh, you know, payment come a settlement kind of product where whatever transactions are done, it gets settled to the merchant's account and then merchant uses it, right? Uh, but given that you are so uh, well entrenched, your engagement level with merchants is so high from fi fintech perspective. How do you help the merchant to, you know, access the account and do basic banking services through the app itself, through the Bharat Pay app, right? Now, the Bharat Pay app is an app that, you know, that the merchant uses on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, obviously, the back end is, again, powered by a bank. And uh, the front end, right, the whole experience with basic sort of banking services is on the fintech app in some ways. So that's, I think, a clear area. It's a sort of a, of collaboration between banks and fintechs, uh, where in some ways both benefit, right? Uh, your base of accounts, especially in the category that we pay in, the small merchants, the Kirana stores, across the length and breadth of the country, 
those are under the uh, banking fold. Uh, and the engagement is driven by us, right? So these are not accounts which once you open, they are dormant. They are engaged, right, on a day-to-day. -day. So I think uh, 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 banking is obviously one, and we'll talk about more. Uh, but like I said, uh, there are uh, multiple areas in which both banks and fintechs can collaborate. It's happened in the past. It's, I think it's getting deeper going forward. Maybe uh, a very specific question because uh, your ecosystem is built around MSMEs and their shops and all of that. What is the benefit you see uh, happening directly to them? Because hum, Ambisha, we think of bankers and fintechs and all, but customer is the final guy who is actually doing. So how is the experience for the customer when they get credit on time, they get make payment on time and all of that? So any experiences you want to share on the customer benefit side? Uh, and some real the, stories as well. The merchants you mean, right? Yeah. yeah. No, no, I think, see, one thing that has happened because of this is, you know, see, payments is a foundation, right? Uh, Payments gives you a visibility in terms of the, uh, you know, the business, the working capital of the merchant, right? Uh, uh, but beyond that, the idea is how you can use it, leverage it to provide other services. So one area where you've seen, uh, you know, scale up a lot of impact to the merchants is obviously, you know, uh, lending, right? Facilitate sort of lending, where uh, given a certain merchant, there are certain set of transactions that are happening on a daily basis. There's certain volume of transactions. How do you use that data in the absence of everything else, right? the absence of other data, formal credit scores? How do you use that data to underwrite a merchant and help him get access to a uh, loan, either working with a bank or a lot of NBFCs who want to lend in this segment, but they either don't have the visibility or they don't have the technology. Technology to either you know, disperse or to collect, right? That is where I think the payment technology comes into place, right? Both from a dispersal as well as from a collection perspective. You can use it to uh, facilitate lending to these merchants. And there, I think we've seen a, uh, uh, there we've seen a great impact across our merchant base, especially in the times uh, post-COVID, uh, where working capital was at sort of uh, a risk, and a lot of merchants were at risk of either, uh, you know, shutting shop or not able to expand uh, I think financing was a key sort of enabler there. So I think that is one key area. There are others, but this is probably the one which has had a lot of impact. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, moving to, uh, you are leading one of the largest entities in the country, right? And Mukul, I, must, I, I, I believe it will be very tough as well, right? So I don't envy your job. So, uh, and you are only general as well. You work across uh, uh, the physical environment. You work on digital environment. You work for retail, you work for uh, MSMEs as well. So I think uh, I wanted to know what is the journey of building such an entity, right, which, is, which, is, which has a lot of diverse variety. Uh, and, and what is the, in the current realm where focus is so much on profitability, uh, what is the focus of uh, Movie Quick as well? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, so the journey of Movie Quick essentially started off when the word fintech was getting coined in the country. Uh, so at that point in time, of course, it was a wallet, uh, you know, provider and before that utility bill payments, recharge uh, kind of a platform. And our journey essentially has been to acquire a large number of customers onto the platform and on the other side, a large number of merchants. So we've, you know, we've got about 135 million customers and about 4 million merchants uh, over a period of time. And of course... 50% of these customers are KYC, full KYC with us. So oh, wow. in that sense, uh, there is a huge amount of responsibility that the platform has. And we've been able to onboard them pretty seamlessly over these years. Uh, so, so initially, the journey was around providing them daily use spend categories. And over a period of time, when UPI came about, uh, you know, a lot more payment forms were enabled uh, for, these, uh, for these customers on the MobiQuick app. Uh, QR, uh, you know, became a very big reality. Interoperability became... Uh, you know, you know, omnipresent. Uh, and then over a period of last couple of years, because of the India stack, uh, you know, the, you know, the focus of MobiQuick has been on, you know, kind of growing the digital financial services business, which is mostly around digital credit, wealth and investment stack. So that's something that we're focusing on pretty largely. Uh, to your question uh, on the profitability side, I, we see that we see payments as a as a contributor or as a, you know, as a channel using which customers come onto the platform. We, of course, look at them, do analyze their data, their transaction patterns, etc. And basis that we, you know, we do their credit underwriting. 
and uh, we've been over the last uh, you know so many years been able to kind of uh, uh, create a very large pool of credit worthy customers we serve about 19000 pin codes in the country which is very very large uh, uh, you know uh, and we of course uh, do very advanced uh, alternate database underwriting uh, with with very good controlled risk rates uh, so the so the thing is that i think this is the business or the, you know the investments and the digital credit business is something which is uh, driving us towards profitability i mean we've done we've already done two quarters of profit uh, last year and we're hopeful the coming year will be uh, of course uh, you know you know continues to continues with that uh, kind of stretch and uh, yeah uh, sky's the limit i, th I think for us uh, the, the client base is huge and the opportunity is immense i mean of course there's another billion customers left to be served by all of course all of the fintechs uh, you know together we are very collaborative i mean that's uh, to the to the point that sir bisachi you know essentially mentioned uh, you know without banks and financial institutions the prof the, the products that we offer run really uh, possible and without the help of npci of course so you know it's a we, we are just a if i would say distribution and and experience layer on top of the 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 products that they provide and uh, i think that makes a bit of a difference there is a niche for us as well uh, to operate and we're pretty confident that uh, we'll be able to mark, uh, you know, mark, create a future for ourselves as well. No, thank you, thank you. Uh, and and IPPB is a classical old world, new world. It's very complicated organization, right? You work across. So, uh, and and uh, I remember uh, somebody who was actually applying for a senior position long back before it was getting created to for the top position in the organization. Uh, in IPPB, uh, spoke to me. He says. Yeah, uh, I'm not applying because I don't know when they will turn profitable. I don't think this built for profitability. And I, I think I, I was reading a few days back that you are heading towards profitability. So, kya kia, what did you do to, to create a framework where uh, payment organizations uh, are also turning profitable? We have to realize some giant houses actually gave up their license uh, across the journey. And you continued and with so much of legacy you have built. So, thoughts on how what you did and what's happening right now? And maybe you are the one of the first CDOs who became CEOs as well, right? So which is brilliant, right? We didn't. I always thought CDOs should become CEOs. It'll, they will actually take the uh, sort of uh, business forward. So let me demystify this uh, for you uh, in terms of you know what IPPB is about. I know this is uh, always a mystery uh, that we all know about a postman and what uh, a post office does. Like uh, you know, in our childhood, uh, we would have visited these post offices, right? Over a period of time, unfortunately, uh, you know, some of uh, the business that is done by post offices uh, have uh, become irrelevant. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, uh, let me tell you, Department of Post has always uh, been aspiring to convert itself into a bank. Uh, but uh, somehow, uh, they have been, uh, they've not been a favorable response from uh, a regulator. But having said that, uh, with uh, 2014, uh, the differentiated uh, licensing norms uh, having kicked in, there, uh, uh, there was an opportunity, and uh, fortunately, uh, Reserve Bank has also decided that yes, payment bank model could be a suitable model given the huge uh, network of uh, the department, and that's how the payment bank uh, license was uh, given. So, from a model perspective, I would say that you know, payment bank model itself is very, very different. I mean, though it is very narrow uh, given uh, its uh, scope of products and uh, services that it can give, uh, so. That, that is a unique model. And within the payment bank, uh, every organization uh, that way uh, has uh, some uniqueness. I mean, you talk about uh, uh, telecom players who got, uh, you know, banking license. Uh, so they look at it differently. And uh, some of the digital players like, you know, Paytm, they look at it differently. So, so everybody has a different uh, perspective uh, when it comes to uh, the payments. Uh, so having said that, uh, uh, the uniqueness with regard to the Department of Post is that uh, Department of Post has already been into financial services. So if you see the small savings mobilization done by Department of Post is uh, one of the huge. The liability book that uh, the department has already mobilized is third highest. It's only next to HDFC and uh, SBI. You know, they uh, have mobilized more than 15 lakh uh, crores in terms of uh, uh, various uh, deposits. So on the top of it, uh, if you add a payment bank license, uh, then it's all about you know adding or bringing that banking technology, the digital banking technology. I think that's what helped us you know turn around uh, things uh, in terms of you know adding services like uh, opening of a bank account and uh, digitization of entire small savings uh, related payments and delivery of uh, cash uh, through postman 
And I would like to say that, especially during COVID time, when the entire uh, infrastructure got shut, uh, it was the postman who was able to deliver uh, this cash. In fact, that uh, was kind of a turnaround. You know, from there on, it was uh, no looking back. And from there on, uh, we started adding more and more uh, services and uh, products. And over a period of time, I must say that uh, because of uh, the adjacencies that we have with uh, the whole small savings uh, business has also helped us uh, build a better CASA franchise. I mean, we are now sitting over 5,500 crore uh, CASA as a payment bank, and it's also one of the highest. But uh, however, yes, uh, how do you become profitable is, has always been a question. Uh, Apart from you know, basic banking services, the other aspect which we looked at when we were redrawing some of the business plan is, look, we are a distribution company. Now, uh, what are other relevant services that you can bring to the doorstep of the uh, uh, rural uh, citizens? And uh, as a part of that, uh, we figured out that uh, the government to person uh, services, you know, whether it is uh, pension related uh, disbursements or other related services. I mean, uh, still there are a lot of uh, demand for other registration, especially for child regi registration or, you know, changing of your mobile. And uh, also the Jeevan Praman, you know, where uh, digital life certificate uh, services uh, to be given to senior citizens who cannot move out of their homes. So some of these uh, services, because our unique strength had been the doorstep banking, because of the postal network and the postman uh, who is always mobile we are able to create a digital layer over the physical network. So that way we are able to create that physical force. And it's more about adding, you know, the re relevant uh, services. And as we add uh, more services, as we added more services, we found that it was, you know, more remunerative. And uh, thankfully, we've recently turned, you know, profitable and hopefully this year we should be able to break even. So this goes to prove that, you know, being a distribution network or it being a distribution company, probably there's always a way to tweak your business model and increase your revenues. I think uh, I always believe that uh, there's so much of focus on giving awards for films and all. Right? I think the bankers should also get awards for doing this kind of stuff, right? And I think government should also support it. We always think of these publicities going to uh, everybody else. I don't know who contributes more to the country. I think it's very specific. I wanted to make a comment on. You look at the ecosystem, you always think of bankers as, as like, kya hai, to bankers hai, but it's a very dry job, but it's a tough job. Anyway, anyway, how many of you are bankers here? Very tough job, very, very tough job. And I must say that the credit goes to the top man uh, who said that uh, now a postman will bring a bank to the doorstep. He said, uh, Dakia, Dak layaga, but now Dakia, bank layaga. <laughs> that makes sense, makes sense. Uh, I think, Arif, uh, you have played all roles, right? Uh, so he has been a banker. Uh, he has worked in a fintech uh, in early stage, uh, very early stage. Then he joined a network and then goes back and heads innovation in the, one of the largest fintech in the country. Uh, your perspective, okay, so why do you do that? Why do you do that? It's a personal question, maybe. You don't want to answer, that's fine. Uh, I think it's your ticket. If you notice, right, if you need the opportunity to wear sneakers, uh, I'm the only guy on this floor, uh, you need to do all this. Okay? And sneakers are comfortable. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I started my career working in a bank, right? And uh, uh, I was with AJC Bank for a long time. Uh, it really grew well. They were the pioneers in a certain way in payments. Uh, fantastic organization, fantastic franchise, right? Uh, that's when the fintech revolution started happening, right? One of the things that I came across is, uh, you know, we all talk about fintech and bank collaboration. Uh, I've been seeing that for many years. I think uh, there was a huge trust deficit when we started, right? And then in my mind, I was trying to peel it, right? I mean, the whole question was who owns the customer, etc. who can do what, who's accountable for what. And I think thanks to the regulator with PAPG and the lending guidelines and the co-brand guidelines, I think a lot has been made clear. So I think what has happened is, uh, what started happening in my mind at that time was, I think the business relationship and trust started getting established, right? Uh, but then there was a big question, and I think you, I mean, there are bankers over here, right? In a bank, who owns the fintech relationship, right? Is it the business guys or is it the tech guys? Or do you see them as vendors or do you see them as partners? You can camouflage whatever you say. So I was on the side of business at once upon a time, and the question is, I owned a relationship with the fintech partner, Everything was going well, but one day there was a downtime. What do I do as a business guy? 
normally as a business guy in a bank, you'll reach out to your tech guys. But here when I reach out to my tech guys and with due respect to them, they say, look, dude, I don't even see the data. It's not in my data center. Right? How do I manage it? So I think that really got me thinking. And it's a realistic question even today. So any of these banks partnering with fintechs where they're not a sponsor and actually using some kind of real tech from the fintech, the question yet remains in my mind, who owns the relationship? What happens when something goes wrong? Not solved, right? And when we were doing this, there was a second catalyst for me, right? There were these global networks who were doing a lot of stuff on ISO. Uh, some great work at that time. But somehow, I always felt that, look, as a country, right? And India was really, you know, we were really, we were getting bolder, let me put it that way, right? And we said, look, if we don't own this protocol, then we're always going to be at the mercy of somebody else, right? And uh, thankfully uh, to the regulator, the government, NPCI was being formed those days, right? And NPCI came up with IMPS, which I got really kicked about. And then on top of that came uh, UPI, right? And then I said, Bhai, this is it. So I, I, like, uh, I think UPI as a product is great, but what really uh, got me excited is UPI as a protocol. And I said, TK, so I did a bit of here and there and said, I think, why not? Because I never saw NPCI as a network, right? I always saw them as an infra company, right? And that's what took me to NPCI. But yeah, three, three and a half years of a lot of hard work, a lot of uh, challenges and scaling up. I thought it's good that I can go back to a startup fintech. Uh, you've done something on this side. Now, how do you leverage? So once NPCI has laid the railroads and protocols, then someone needs to build platforms around it, right? So that's what brought me here. But I think uh, what I would like to leave this audience and this panel is, where is the uh, fintech and the banking partnerships heading, right? And I think uh, uh, there is no easy solve for it, unless, in my view, if I give a cue, right? I think uh, in India and globally, uh, cloud, I mean, whether it's Amazon or Google, they are the ones who really enabled the startup ecosystem. I think the answer lies there. So if you guys are looking somewhere else, then there is going to be a challenge. But I think uh, we have some bankers over here. I'm an ex-banker. So probably he's the right guy to you know fill in over there. And so is he. Through the next decade. I think uh, that, that understanding has evolved, it's become more mature. All of us understand that it's a symbiotic relationship. That's the only way forward. And both of both the bankers and the fintechs and the tech fins, you know, we all forget uh, in this whole hype around technology, new platforms, we all forget that there are these huge behemoths who were the tech fins decades back who have been driving banking, right? Today we might deride Swift, but SWIFT was the organization which set up a globally acceptable standard which has seen the test of time. Yes, today it's not dynamic, today there are issues, we need to do lots more, what is blockchain, can CBDC ride on SWIFT and make cross-border payments like you referred, uh, a reality in terms of making it real time rather than still being you know, reconciled even after a week the payment has moved. All those questions are there, but let's not forget the contribution that Swift made. So we forget the whole, you know, the platform and the standardization that technology companies have done earlier along with banks. And I think to my mind that ecosystem has worked very well. Today it's in a new avatar where banks and uh, fintechs are working in a very, very different way. Banking, I, I, banking is not boring. It's extremely exciting, thanks to fintech sitting next to me. I think it's, uh, it's really kind of made the bankers open up their eyes, and I think there are enough and more solutions, and I was, we were talking about B2B. What you know, comes to my mind is, why can't, why can't a trade message of a letter of credit get bundled along with the RTGS payment? Exactly, why are we doing why does it? Exactly, why does it have to be two different platforms? That is what we have to solve. A banker can solve it on its own, no way. But can the banking community give standards, define guardrails, define procedures, policies? Yes, definitely, that is their role. But I think it's going to be tech fins and fintechs who are going to partner and make that a reality. There is no reason in today's day and age for letters of credit and payments to be moving separately. So I think those are the opportunities and like I said, this relationship has evolved. It's become much more mature to uh, RF's point of in terms, you know, who owns the relationship. I think, yes, like I said, bankers were caught off guard, right? And, uh, you know, there was this, I, I uh, remember somebody saying that the last innovation in banking 
happened hundreds of years ago when overdraft was invented. Correct. After that, nothing has happened in banking. I tend to disagree, but that's probably a matter of another You panel. said it, we didn't say it, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, so where from, uh, he spoke about uh, that you guys took it ahead, right? I think a lot of stuff you guys did with UPI was way ahead of its time. Uh, what is Bharat Pay up to right now? What are the new uh, areas of innovation you are sort of driving? I think we would love to hear about it. Uh, and if you, it's a trade secret, you can ignore, give it, give it some part of it. But I would, would love to hear because now you have a very different ecosystem working with you. And you have a bank uh, which is partnering with you very, very closely. <laughs> Nothing is a trade secret. Uh, I think uh, everyone is trying to get into similar things or at least, uh, you know, do variants of a similar things. <coughs> See, uh, from a perspective, like I was mentioning, while payments and scaled up, right, there it was more of an incremental sort of game, right? How do you make it uh, more seamless from experience perspective? And how do you sort of uh, add, you know, scale while ensuring a certain success rates? I think Largely, we are there. Uh, now it's about, uh, you know, from here, how do you add more merchants? How do you add more scale to there and ensure your partnerships and tech stacks are there? I think in terms of innovation uh, or new things that we're doing, uh, you know, like I said, there are a bunch of things we're trying out. And almost all of it is in partnership with bank, with NPCI, with one entity or the other. Uh, so, for example, one of the things that we are actively working on is uh, Rupee on UPI, right? Absolutely. So, uh, I think it's a great initiative. Uh, it really, you know, cards are like a form factor. If I just compare payments, you know, there is QR uh, and then there is, uh, you know, uh, POS machines. And there is an order of magnitude different in scale, Correct. right? You have POS machines, few million single digit, low single digit million, whatever, right? And QR codes are like tens of millions, right? Whatever, right? So it's an order of magnitude difference. Now with Rupin UPI, what happens is, you know, you don't need a POS machine. And especially for our base, where, you know, we have also tried, uh, you know, adopt a sort of penetrating POS machines in a base, right? But again, the difference in penetration is significant. It's a matter of, you know, whether there is a need, whether there is affordability, whether there's that kind of base. So with Rupee and UPI, the whole segment of these small merchants opens up uh, from accepting another kind of payment form factor, right? I think that's one. Second is, you know, uh, this whole thing of, you know, sachet size credit card usage, that goes up, right? Uh, tomorrow, I don't need to think whether, you know, it's a certain ticket size payment, I'll use my card or else I'm using my... Uh, UPI app to pay, right? Today, irrespective of what the ticket size is, I'm using the same app very seamlessly, either using a debit or a credit kind of transaction. So for us, uh, you know, both from a payments and from a uh, consumer perspective, right? Uh, we do have a consumer vertical now as well. I think uh, Rupee and UPI is uh, probably one thing which we are uh, sort of betting on that will take off. And that will be for us like a big thing going forward. I agree. I think uh, once uh, all cards come on UPI, or maybe more form factors of utilization, I think uh, one, I think POS uh, technically should not exist. It's very expensive, very, very difficult to maintain. It's only built for some specific use cases, which is, should I still remain. But for general reason, I think we should, uh, the way you guys have built uh, zero, almost zero cost, cost acquisition, I think that is what will work really well. I'm not talking about that zero MDR. I'm just saying POS is an issue. Yeah. No, I agree. I think the logistics that's involved, right, behind POS, ensuring it's active, maintenance servicing, it's significant. So there'll be a segment where it exists, but there is a large volume where this can be sort of a, a great solution. Now you give it to a Panwala, he can't handle it, right? So we need to realize what use cases. I am also like a Panwala. We have to learn how to use POS machine. I speak so much about it, but physically I used it only in this, in this event where we had to get one for us. We never needed for ourselves, right? So it was difficult to get through, but yeah, thank you, thank you. I think uh, uh, from a from a uh, from an organization perspective, I think MobiQuick has done some fab stuff, right? Uh, but uh, I think one of the challenges in the current environment is how do you balance innovation with uh, with the regulat regulations, right? I I, I think payment uh, ecosystem existed uh, when the regulations didn't exist, so it's a very long 20 years it took 
regulators to come in 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 the in the, in the structure of uh, even gateway i remember in kotak day somebody met me from kotak saying your name is there is still in the code uh, 20 20 years, years back when you had launched the bank right so in the payment gateway system so i think it's remained um, uh, sort of the same so how do you think the what is the next level of uh, uh, framework which we can build which will ha have innovation along with uh, regulatory compliance I think the regulations exist so that there is a level of standardization Absolutely. among uh, you know the people who are operating the platforms today and uh, the incumbents uh, or those who are coming in. So uh, I think this uh, you know the the uh, the presence of the regulations only helps to standardize, only helps to make sure that uh, uh, whichever entities are operating are operating under a you know kind of a, a framework where the the customers benefit and. Uh, you know, the extent laws and guidelines and the data privacy laws, info security guidelines are all met. Uh, so it becomes a minimum standard for somebody to create, to operate in. And therefore, the innovation is going to be, uh, you know, kind of structured on top of that. So that becomes the baseline or from where every other, uh, you know, every other product and service has to be created. Uh, because at the end, all of us are in the business of creating good customer experiences. But at the same time, it has to comply to the uh, the regulatory framework so that, uh, you know, we are, we are able to kind of create a, uh, you know, a centralized and a very coherent, uh, you know, in environment for the customer to operate and there is no pilferage of data and so on and so forth. So I think, it, you know, any organization which positions and shows itself to be compliant on the, on the guidelines is only able to present and uh, present a more trust uh, worthy picture to the to its customers and therefore will be able to bring on more uh, you know kind of customers uh, to its fold so so in a sense i mean it is a given it is a prerequisite uh, okay. for any organization uh, who is entering into the fintech or for that matter any other uh, space and uh, you know the innovation of course it doesn't kill the innovation at all i mean the challenge in fintech is to uh, yeah kind of innovate while considering the regulatory uh, you know things in the mind so that's that's the difficult part, and I think that's what everybody is here is solving for. Oh, brilliant. I think, uh, thank you guys. I think uh, the panel was so powerful. I'm just thinking that uh, 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 Sunicorn, Decacorns, I don't know, Unicorns, I don't know what all are in the, on the panel right now. Uh, I think it's brilliant. And then, of course, uh, somebody building the uh, payment bank at scale, I think if it is valued, I'm sure it'll be a... Yeah. Samir, Decacorn. I have one point on this FinTech uh, bank debate. See. Uh, uh, we all should understand that it uh, happened for the good of the banks, number one, and uh, it bettered the customer experience, uh, no doubt about it. You know, while it's a good problem to have, you know, wherein, you know, some of the fintechs having uh, bigger aspirations, you know, want to become uh, banks. But uh, what really changed is the way technology is uh, being consumed. And if you look at the traditional technology players, so you always have this problem of, you know, going through a series of CRs, not able to complete uh, the developments in time. See, today, that problem is not there anymore, uh, especially with uh, fintechs having skin in the game. So they're equally involved uh, in, in the development and that bettered customer experience, I must say. Oh, I agree. I, I think this ecosystem has evolved. And, and all bankers talking about digital is also crucial and then driving it out, right? I, I am telling you that uh, I have been the same ecosystem as a digital guy for 23, 24 years. I, in city, I used to head digital 23 years back. Uh, and I remember uh, I was used or I was liked guy, but not respected. Why right? is he spoiling his career? I still remember somebody telling my friend who was doing similar work, right? So I think that is called digital. I always have three responsibility. I always used to report to offset, op tech head, and a business head. So I think that career continued, but I think this is called digital. So I think, thank you guys. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think this is a fabulous uh, panel here. Thank you guys for joining. I was always worried that how many people will go to the But thank you for making it out. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the a great audience here. Right? Are you guys enjoying? Are you enjoying? Are you enjoying? Thank you guys. Thank you.